Or however you would touch it, however you would speak to them, that they may know that you live. You would make begin to live in their hearts. Father, for each and one of us who travel such a great distance, O oh Lord, for I know you're at least. For whatever things that are going to be said and done today, throughout this week, O oh Father, for every ordinance that we may partake of, whether it be in this building or it be in our seminar classes, or if we have to anoint somebody in a hallway, Lord, that you may feel, you may be with us, Lord. You give us the prayer that will touch a brother or sister or their family member that needs your help at that time. So no doubt, Father, and stay up, Father. Lord, be with my brothers, you're going to take the lead. Be with Brother Wayne as well. We ask all those families of blessing in Jesus' name. Just uh, checking on the lapels and on. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Trying to get the, the, the uh, lapel mic to work. Um, you know, I'm famous in my branch having turned it off and preached the entire sermon without it. So we'll do our best. But good morning and welcome to the GMBA camp. I'm Brother Paul, I'm one of your ministers, and I, I greet you in the love of God. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you're all excited. Um, some of you came from far distances. We thank you for that. Some are local. We thank you for that. We thank all that came. And we would ask you this, this morning that you would have a prayer in your heart, not just for me and for Brother Wayne who will follow, but for all the brothers that would exhort you, for your seminar teachers, for the brothers and sisters that will teach you, for those that will be instructing the children, for those that will be inter interacting with you at various points, that the Spirit of God might throw, might flow freely the entire time we're here. Anybody here for the first time? Welcome to GMBA camp. It is getting close to 60 years of existence. And anybody get excited this week when you actually just said, I'm going to camp? Okay. So when I found out I was able to go, I actually went in my church calendar, because I figured that was a really good place to put this, and put it out of office that I'm at GMBA camp. And when I typed in the words GBA camp out, and I hit enter, I stopped. And the flood of glorious blessings came across. It came across expecting the Lord to bless us. So I did the normal thing that I would have always done, Brother Lucas. I checked the weather for the end of the week, hoping for baptisms, and it'll be good weather. So we're good. <laughs> that's just me. That's, you know, guess a little nerdy. But that's okay. But there's a blessing just coming to GMBA camp. I remember Brother Chuck's baptism. It was a glorious camp. I remember really well, Brother Chuck, this is the last day I actually met my wife for the first time. So that is a little bit a little higher, so you can understand. <laughs> How many of us met our spouses at camp? How many met your best friends at camp? Uh, okay. Lots of friendships. How many met people that you're going to travel on missionary work with, brothers, at camp? You know, I was thinking this week, when the angel flew in the midst of heaven, the Lord and the Father had GME camp out in the plans already. Now we don't understand that, brothers and sisters, but the Lord knows all things. GME camp is part of the restoration story. Can I get an amen on that? It absolutely is. It's been the greatest domestic outreach of baptisms in, in the church over the last 60 years. So we're excited to be here. What do you, you, what's your friend next to you? 
not the guy or girl next to you, not your spouse next to you. What do you want out of the week? You don't have to all shout the answers at the same time, okay? Keep it to yourself, but do you personally have an objective of what you want out of the week? Okay, we'll leave that for later. You can figure that out. That's like, so here's our first icebreaker. Anybody looking at this logo? Okay, anybody, you might love one word, you might love, I actually love the magnifying glass. Okay, and I can't do it like the laser while I'm speaking, it's gonna go everywhere, it's gonna go around my neck, I just can't do it, all right? So on your laser, anybody notice anything on your landlord, your land, you're about that magnifying glass? Anybody? It's like, this is called audience feedback. Okay? Go ahead. Yes, you have one. You have one. You have a little magnifying glass on your landing. Sister Sophia, that's awesome. I love that. I want you to take that magnifying glass and put it in the mirror and focus on you. Focus on renewing you, or as Brother Chuck said, those of you that aren't baptized, focusing on a new you. Okay. And if we all focus on renewing or having a new you, we are going to have an awesome renewed focus camp. I can guarantee you that. So let's start off with some scripture. All right. So our goal is to be renewed. How do we, how do we be renewed? Bear with me. I'm going to use this book as long as I can. It's my father's, so I, I, I like to keep it. I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We ask you to present your body as a living sacrifice. The Lord wants us to be clean vessels. He wants us to be a righteous people. Because you know that magnifying glass I was joking about? He absolutely has it on the church. He has the magnifying glass on the church. Because he wants us to be the church of Jesus Christ. So he could show forth his power to all the nations and to Israel. That he would bring about his great purposes. Amen? He has his magnifying glass on us. He wants us to be a righteous people. But we have people that want to conform us. They want to, anybody ever conform something, bend it to your will? Okay? People outside want us to bend to their will, to their ideas, to their morals, to their, to their thoughts. And Jesus Christ wants us to be conformed to him, to be transformed to him by the renewing of our mind, not conformed to outside influences. You and I should be the greatest influence to others, not vice versa. The Lord has blessed us, brothers and sisters, and wants us to be transformed. He wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind in Christ, that we may prove, we may prove what is the good, acceptable, but especially the perfect will of God. Anybody ever do something good and you feel good about it? Anybody ever do something perfect in the will of God? Made that phone call. Visited that person that was a shut-in. Made a meal for somebody. Sent a text to somebody. And the blessings that came back far outweighed what you gave. Anybody ever ever hacked anybody? <laughs> okay, that's the perfect will of God. He wants us to do that. He wants us to be transformed by continually focusing upon Him. Our daily focus. It says, what does it say? His mercies renew every what? Every week, every month, every year. Is that about right? When do His mercies renew? Every day. Every day his mercies renew. Do you know why they renew every day? Do you know why they renew every day? Because we need it. 
We need his mercies every day. And what does he want from us? He wants us to have a mind that's focused on him. We had a, we had a beautiful service a little over two and a half, well, a little over two years ago. We were around the communion table at the conference, and the Lord had blessed us that conference. And he proceeded to tell the congregation that all those blessings are confirmed by the oath. Confirmed by an oath. You know what that oath was? The oath of him going to the cross. Him going to the cross and dying for you and rising on the third day. That is the oath. He made a testament. He made a testament. As our brother spoke under the Spirit of God, that we would remind you. We would remind you. He rose from the dead. So whatever baggage you came with today, anybody bring, I don't mean your, your luggage, anybody bring baggage to camp, you don't need to raise your hands. I'm going to tell you the answer is yes. Every year people bring baggage. They bring baggage. Some of it's lightweight. Some of it tips the scales. God wants us to give him the baggage. Now he wants us, he doesn't want to have to compel us. He wants us to do it of our own volition. He does. He wants us to present ourselves as a living, as a living sacrifice to him. Those of you that are in the gospel, he wants you to renew yourself daily with him. Oh, there's nothing better than waking up early in the morning. Now, you may say you like it late at night. Nothing better for me than to wake up in the morning and to read scripture. Anybody have any go-to scriptures in the morning that you do? No matter how your, how your week looks? Yeah, if I'm having a rough week, I'm in Psalm 1. I'm, I'm there, I'm in Psalm 1. Memorize it. That you might renew yourself every day. He wants us to be transformed, not conformed. He wants us to stand out and renew our focus on him. And you know, he'll, he'll do what he needs to. It says in Elma, it says in Elma, how blessed it is, okay? Do you not suppose that they are more blessed who truly humble themselves because of the word? He can compel us to be humble. But oh, how blessed we are, brothers and sisters, when we want to renew our focus by being humbled every day. You know, he will compel us as necessary. Anybody ever have a 30-minute conversation with your parents where you needed a little bit of correction? Anybody? Am I the only one that can raise both hands? I, I, I've been there. I've been there. How about three hours? Anybody ever have a three-hour drill down? Probably not too many. Well, there was this wonderful man. You all know who I'm talking about. And uh, though I don't know his first name, and I look forward to the day the record comes forth because I want to know his first name. That's probably, probably the first thing I'm going to look at. All right? And uh, they were on the seashore for four years. They weren't doing bad. They were doing good. They weren't doing what was a problem. Now, they weren't doing actually good, but they weren't like they were. They weren't like horrible people. I'm trying to get to. And it says that the. Uh, came to pass. The Lord came again and his brother Jared and stood in a cloud and talked with him and for the space of three hours. Did the Lord talk with your brother Jared? That's a long three hours, brothers and sisters. That's a long three hours to renew your focus. But the Lord loved him so much that he renewed his focus and he became one of the greatest men of God in the scriptures. Not the greatest. There's only one who's the greatest. And that's Jesus Christ. Okay? But the Lord did chastise him. And he corrected him. And he renewed his focus. The Lord sometimes renews our focus by getting our attention. And you know what? I don't know all of your lives. The Lord does. But the Lord knows how to get your attention. Anybody agree with me on that? Does the Lord know how to get your attention? Yeah, he does. He knows how to get my attention. And it's probably different than the way he gets your attention. But he gets our attention. And when the Lord gets your attention, and he wants you to refocus, is there any question on who got that your attention? When the Lord gets your attention, right? 
Is there any doubt in your mind who just got your attention? The answer is no. You know when the Lord's speaking to you. You know when the Lord's giving your attention to renew your focus. So that you might be, you might be the church of Jesus Christ. You might be the bride, because at the end of the renewed is wed. Okay? And as a church one day, we will be wed to Jesus Christ. We will be the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. He's working with us. And we would call all, he will call all nations into this church. Do you believe that? Do you believe all different ethnicities are going to be in this church? All different groups of people are going to be in this church. That's our destiny. Our destiny is to have the entire world come to a knowledge of the church of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be up here. I wouldn't be neither with the brothers. We're not here to preach you just a Sunday sermon. We're to tell you that you are the church of Jesus Christ. He wants us to renew our focus. And those of you that haven't met the Lord, there is no better week than to meet the Lord than a GMBA camp. Amen? There's no better week to meet the Lord. You're going to have questions. He's got the answers. He's going to inspire people to come to you. Anybody at camp ever happen where you had a question, you didn't know what you should do, and all of a sudden you put someone in your path to answer that question. Anybody ever say, I don't really want to go in that prayer circle. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I need to go in that prayer circle. And happen to anybody? Yeah, it's happened to a lot of us. He wants us to do that. And, and before I close, I want to just share with you, those of you that are considering making your self new, it is an awesome scripture. Because it gives the parallels. And this is how you and uh, he's talking about, before he, he became a new you, or a new us, he was wrapped with torment. He was harrowed up by the memory of his many sins. And he remembered one simple fact. He remembered that his father told him about the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what he did... He did the most important thing that you and I need to do. He reached out. He reached out for the almighty victor. Everybody, anybody like the victor? I know there's some here that love the, like, the victor song. We can get a whole group here. You know the ultimate victor is Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate victor. He's the ultimate one who gave victory in Alma in the torment of his soul. He reached out. And he reached out, said, this is, I cried within my heart, Oh Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. And when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. And this is one of my favorite verses. Yea, I say unto you, my brothers and sisters that have went into the waters, Young people that went into the waters, I want you to remember this. Those of you that haven't went into the waters, I'm going to offer this. That there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter. So exquisite there means rare. It means, it means rare of how significant, how horrendous were my pains. Yea, and again I say unto you, my son and my brothers and sisters, that on the other hand, there could be nothing so exquisite. In that case, exquisite means beautiful and sweet, as was my joy. How many of you remember that joy? How many of you remember that joy? How many of you get a chance to reflect on that joy? Do you remember the day that you got joy? I do. Do you remember the day that he came and he washed you clean? I, I know the day, I know the time, I know the exact location. Okay? But Tom Garage, he gave his daughters, he gave his daughter GPS coordinates. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out what they were. They were the GPS coordinates of the river down the road where they were baptized. Okay? Anybody of you, I, I didn't do my GPS coordinates for the pond in Imperial, but I would, but I probably will. But I remember that day. So if you want to have a new you, if you want to have a new us, let's focus on a new you. Let's focus on renewing you. Let's focus on us 
in our relationship to God. And I'll close you with this one verse, and I don't need to look it up. I know it. It's after 1241. And I commend you that you might seek after this Jesus. That's at the end of the day. What's your message, Brother Paul? I commend you to seek Jesus. I could boil it down in one sentence. I commend you to seek Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the founder of our church. He's the leader of our church. He's the one that rose from the grave. He's the one that will be victorious in your life. And he will be the one who meets us in Zion. He will be the one who meets us in Zion. So we close with that. I commend you to seek Jesus all week. And when you go home, keep it up every day. His mercies renew every day. May God bless you. We love you. And we pray that you might enjoy camp like the Lord intended for you to enjoy camp. God bless you. Amen. Pray again to all of you. Brother Paul started with new us, and he concluded with new you. And those were my very thoughts also. So bear with me for a moment. University here a few years ago, they changed their name. It used to be Cal U, and now it's Penn West. For a moment, let's pretend it's Cal U, okay? Our challenge this week is to transform Cal U into new you, okay? because that's the, the opportunity that we have. That's the power that we have in Christ together. This is one of our rare gatherings in the Church of Jesus Christ of this kind of number. It's really general church conferences and GMBA camp. You know how we are, right? We, we love new things. A new baby's born, and it gets so much attention that you even forget for a moment who the parents were that brought it into the world. Right? You get a new house, oh, come over, I'm going to show you my new house. Buy a new car, oh, let's go for a ride. I want you to, we love the newness of things. God loves New you. God loves you. He's been preparing for a new you and new me for a long time. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Said if it were not so, I would have told you. He's preparing for new you. We, we read, as we're expecting this kingdom of peace upon the earth, that from time to time Christ will be with us. He will visit us there. And that's so special to me because I didn't have the opportunity to see his ministry fulfilled in Jerusalem. I didn't have the opportunity in the Americas with the Nephites when he was here. But if the Lord would grant some, many, all of us that opportunity, we're going to have that time to commune with Christ. He was already preparing for new you and new me. Sometimes we have a hard time getting there, don't we? Transformations throughout the scripture have been difficult. Personal transformations from who we are to where God wants us to be, new you, can be difficult. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but to prove the difficult transformations point, I want you to think of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. How easy of a journey that was. How about the Nephites from Jerusalem to the Americas? How about the Jaredites from the old country to the new country? And yes, Brother Paul, I had many one-hour sessions with my dad. I never had a three-hour session, and I never want that three-hour session 
with the Lord. By the way, when my father had something to tell you, and it wasn't restricted to his children, by the way. Brother Frank, I think you probably heard a few of those things. It didn't matter what your plans were. Friday night, when you had friends coming over, when you had plans to go do something, everything was on hold until he adjusted that perspective that was out of skew. Brother Chuck shared with us his, a little bit of his conversion testimony. And I've heard it many times, brother never gets old. Getting to new you for me was difficult. And I just want you to know, you don't have to attend a seminar this, this week. You don't have to attend a service. You don't have to attend a prayer meeting to make a commitment with the Lord. If you have that desire today, you don't have to wait any further in the week. It doesn't matter. The Lord is ready for new you. So I'm in a relatively small branch. This would have been in the 70s. I'm dating myself. I'm sorry. Um, in August, thank God, 52 years, I found new you. At a camp out. It wasn't Matsonetta, but I love the name because I needed it. It's called New Hope. And if any of you need new hope today, the Lord has it for you. He has new you for you. It was a, a time of revival in our branch. Rarely in a two-year period does the Lord ever work in such a way to double the size of your branch. But that's what happens. In two years, we had 25 requests for baptism. And not by the ones and by the twos, some weeks by the fours and by the sixes. I'm, just, I'm ashamed to tell you what I'm going to tell you next. I sat through all of them. Sat through all of them. I had the same problem, Brother Chuck. I was BNR, born and raised. Brother Chuck was not, it didn't matter. We can put obstacles in our path that are not real. They just delay a reconciled situation with the Lord. And my obstacle was, how did I, how could I know that I was going to endure to the end? You know, we all want to do things well. We all want to give our best. We all want to give our all. And I was at the crossroads of indecision, brothers and sisters, for two years. I must have asked 50 ministers. That would have been like asking every brother that's here. The same question. How do I know that I can endure to the end? And on your own, we can't. But with the support and the strength of the brothers and sisters, we can. And one day, at a gathering just like this, the GMBA chaplain had a wonderful thought. I'm going to call a 6 a.m. prayer, fasting and prayer service to draw the young people closer. Now, I'm not baptized at this point. What prompted me to be at that 6 o'clock a.m. prayer service? I can't tell you to this day other than it was the Lord's plan. My parents weren't there. My two siblings weren't there, although they were a king. I was at the crossroads of indecision. If you're there today, if you're at the crossroads of indecision, don't stay there. That's not where the blessings are. That's not where the rewards are, where the answered prayers were. You know, generally we think of submission as a weakness. Our society does. I want you to know in serving God, submission is strength. Submitting to the Lord, giving in, putting our will in the background, submitting to His is strength. Lord, you know better. You have a greater plan, you have a greater way for me. Let me put mine in the background, I'm going to follow yours. 
The Spirit of God came into that fasting and prayer meeting in such a great number. And I'm sure all of you can think of this. Think back to your day. The wonderful thing about new you, the wonderful thing about conversion story, it doesn't matter whether it's been a year ago or 50 years ago. You can probably tell me the date. You can probably tell me the circumstances, where you were, what was going on. Because it was that meaningful and that impactful in your life. The Spirit of God came into that service so strongly that I knew I had one of two choices. To submit and render obedience or physically get up and leave the way. Thank God I stayed. And for the first time, brothers and sisters, from the time that I was of an accountable age, for the first time I felt freedom in Christ. I was not bound anymore. The Lord found near you. When I stood on my feet to make that decision, I, I don't remember any of this. The people that were there told me later. The words that I said is, I'm tired of fighting against God. And oh, I was. A two-year fight. Two years at that meaningless intersection. I said, now I want to fight against the enemy of our soul. And apparently I wasn't the only one that felt that strong, convincing, convicting spirit that day. Because within 15 minutes, 16 souls rendered obedience to the Lord. And many of them are, are here in this room today. That's what the Lord can do for you and I. The Lord gave me this example this morning as I was praying. I've never used it before. But I want you to think of, of your life for a minute in something we routinely talk about in the church. The apostasy, the falling away, the reformation, and the restoration. And here's what the Lord wanted me to share with you. From the time that we're of accountable age, and you know right from wrong, we start becoming apostate. We don't use that word much anymore. But we start distancing ourselves from God. We start taking upon us sin and sinning with knowledge. It's the nature of, of whom we are. And as we build up guilt because of that sin, sometimes we try to reform ourselves to an extent. I'm not going to use that bad language anymore. I'm going to try to get rid of these bad habits that I have. I'm going to quit lying, and I'm going to tell the truth more and more. You see, it, it's, not, it's not a good plan. It's kind of like the Reformation churches that, that tried to improve some of the ordinances, but never actually got there. You know where I'm going with this, right? So what do we actually need? We actually need restoration in our lives. We need new you. And David understood that. He said, Lord, give me a clean heart. Give me a clean understanding. And I'll liken that unto our days. Lord, give me a clean tongue. Give me new priorities. Give me a new desire in my life that I might please you. And so you see, we run the whole gamut of apostasy, reformation, and restoration in our lives. And if you've been restored, the last verse of the fifth chapter of Alma, the checking on me chapter, has something in it for everybody. It says, for you that have already committed to serve the Lord, I speak to you by commandment. Keep going. Run the race to the end. The prize is at the end, the Apostle Paul says. The race is not given to the swift or to the fleet, but to those that endure to the end. And those that haven't coveted, those that haven't found new you, you know what the writer says? I speak to you by invitation. And that's the Lord's invitation. Come unto me, ye that are weary, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you freedom. I'll give you new you like you didn't know could exist.
exist. The freedom through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want. This weekend is really about our soul. We make many preparations in life. We spend a lot of time planning for our retirement, for our education, for our medical coverage, and, not, and don't misunderstand me, none of these things are bad, right? It's just living life. Are we spending equal or better quality time for our soul? You know, these, these last two and a half years, I'll spare you the details, have put many things in focus for me. This life is just a blip in God's time. It doesn't matter whether you live 30 years or 60 years or 100 years or 94 years like my father-in-law that just passed. And by the way, if you could sign up for that plan, you probably would. 94 years, a bad couple months at the end, and right into the paradise of God. Sign me up. I'm ready. There are many things that we have to endure in this life. And they're just blips. They're just preparing us somehow in ways that we might not know, in ways that we might not understand, for the time that will come for all of us, that when our work here on earth is done, that the Lord might take us to his heavenly and his eternal kingdom. But while we're here, we're required to work. We're required to labor for the Lord. Work for the night is coming when no man and no woman shall work anymore. That's what's required of us. Jesus said it so well in just really one phrase. What do we gain? What does it profit us if we gain the whole world and lose our soul? This week is about considering our soul, the health of our soul, the welfare of our soul, the saving of our soul through Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, all women unto me. In other words, that power is there. That drawing power is sufficient for every man and woman upon the face of the earth from the time of Adam until the end of time. But yet, as our brother Paul said, he's not going to compel us. Compelling can be painful. He wants willing workers. And so he invites you, he pleads with us, he exhorts us. This is the ministry of reconciliation, of reconciling us back unto the Lord Jesus Christ, back into the presence of God. You know, whatever gifts or talents that God has given me, artistry is not one of them. Some of my children do very well in that area, but not me. But there's a passage, and I'll close with this, there's a passage in the Book of Mormon that I love. That after we're baptized, it says that we walk through the gate. An artist, if one of you can paint this or draw it, it'd be great. After we're baptized, we walk through the gate and onto that straight and narrow path. And what's on the right and left of that path? The rod of iron, the Word of God, the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And that straight and narrow path, if we would stay upon it, it would lead us to God's heavenly and eternal kingdom. And I can envision Christ on that path. As we're walking, he's looking at us. And he's beckoning us to keep walking. Keep running the race. Keep going. You haven't finished yet. And while he's doing that, He's trying to fashion us and shape us and mold us and even purge us to be that brother and sister in Christ that he wants us to be. Don't look at who you are now. Look at what the Lord can do in your life and in my life. Look at his transforming power. Lord must have a sense of humor. 
At 18 years old, he knew that my least favorite thing to do in school was public speaking. So where did he put me most Sundays? He has a sense of humor. He can make your weaknesses strong. He's the great multiplier. All you have to do is turn it over to him. Relinquish control. Say, here am I, Lord, take me and use me. As the prophet said, here am I, volunteer for the army of the Lord. Sign up. Let the Lord create that new you. Let him create the vision of you that he has. Not what we see of ourselves at this time. May God bless you. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to tell you my name. I'm simply going to tell you that I am the brother that's sitting behind that monitor. <laughs> and now I'm going to give you a little bit of marketing this morning. Because I'm here to tell you that there is not a bad seat in this house. And you might say, well, how is that possible? It's your perspective, right? And just let me lay it out to you this way. When I walked up, I was the last one up, right? And that was the seat that was left. And I don't know if you saw, but I took a glance around and I couldn't get back to any other chairs, right? And so I sat down, obstructed view. And if that is my perspective, it would simply be that I can't see half the congregation. I feel like I'm closed off. I feel like there's a partition between me and most of you. But now let me market it for you. This is what you don't see, right? What you don't see is that there's a fan just off wings, <laughs> right? And I've got the best seat in the house. I see some of you fanning yourself, and I'm sitting up there just a nice breeze. Right? I can also market it this way. That every time we sing a hymn, I have fantastic eye contact with a lot of people that are looking at the words. And I may have even waved or smiled at some of you, and I wonder why you're not responding. It's because you're not looking at me. But that's okay, too. And how does this fit in? Right? How does it fit in is this way, that the world does the same thing. It's all marketing, right? And so I just want to use this simple example this morning. If you go to the grocery store, if you go back to your room, when you get back home, you will see a product that you purchased, and on that product will be the words new and improved, right? And you're going to get home and you're going to, so this is my little takeaway, right, for you to take the camp back home with you, right? When you get home and you see that, you're like, how did you know that? I knew that because that's the world. The world is marketing, right? It's to get you to see their perspective. And we talk about this on so many levels, right? If it's just pressure to, it's not such a bad thing, come and do it, right? There's this good part to it, there's that good part to it. Come on in, come over and try it, right? Well, I just want to shed a little light on marketing for you. I wrote a couple things down, and I'm not in marketing by any means. Um, but on every one of those products, when you get back home, that says new and improved, there are countless numbers of people behind the scenes that are engineering it, they're manufacturing it, they're designing it, and there's even a, a CEO who is orchestrating it all, and in his ear is whispering a CFO, and I can tell you that that new product on some level can be made faster, has cheaper ingredients, and they'll make a bigger profit. 
And guess what? We buy it. We buy right in, right? We see it, it looks shiny, it looks fantastic. We turn on our TV or any social media, right? And there's this message that now it does this. We had this problem before, and now we've got this. Let's go and get it. It actually works. I've done it before, right? We're out of the blue. I'll, be, I'll, I'll remember that I saw this ad, and it makes me want to go and get that thing. It works too perfectly. It doesn't work with Gospels. Okay? So that's the cynical side of me when I'm pointing out all of those things. And forgive me if you're a marketer and you do believe, right, that there's something good. Or if there's a company out there that is making an honest effort, right, to do the right thing, it's potentially possible. But it's not only a sinful world that we live in, it's a cynical world. And I think that you can easily make that connection that I just made with the products that we're purchasing. One of my favorite ones is um, I always bought the same brand of yogurt. This is a little thing. I noticed these things, right? And, uh, and then this yogurt, I paid X amount of money for it, right? And I noticed that after a while, I, when I purchased it, it was only about maybe there was a big space left at the top. Right, like a half an inch of space, and I started looking into it, and there was less yogurt in there, right? And I was paying the same price. And I looked at the back of this container, or on the side of the container, and it said, we now provide space for your favorite toppings. <laughs> And I said, I'm getting less yogurt. <laughs> and, the, and the history of the Reformation, it can be glamorized in a similar way. You can look at it and say, there were valiant men and women at that time who saw something that they didn't agree with. And they they stood up and they fought for it and they made a change. But the cynical side of me says new and improved. They didn't like where they were. They didn't like what they had. And so we're going to change this. We're going to change that. We're going to get a quicker manufacturing process. We're going to get cheaper ingredients. And it's going to be better. And it's not the truth. And that's what screams out to me when I look at this logo. Is the word renew. And I just want to read to you some of the things that I found. I do like the, uh, I do like the magnifying glass for the bar. I like it a lot. Uh, but I do want to say this. My thought was way different. My thought on the magnifying glass was, I'm not the only one that was a kid, right? And when I had a magnifying glass, I could, it could be used as an incredible instrument. I could see things closer and more clearly. I could find an ant, right? And I could, I could study it and see it in a way that I'd never seen it before, right? I could, I could, uh, more detail, more understanding. And then I put my head back and burned it. <laughs> I don't think I'm the only one. Forgive me, Lord. Yeah. Am I the only one? Well, here's the, here's the other side of me. The Spirit of God is the same way. The Spirit of God is the same way. It can make you see things more clearly. It can help you. It's a powerful instrument. And it's powerful in the other way as well. If you're not in line, if you're not in tune, if you're not right with the Spirit of God, poof. 
And I'm not a preacher of doom and gloom or hellfire and brimstone, but it exists, right? It's a truth. And that's what I'm here for today, is just to give you the truth. I was talking about what I found with Renew. This is what I found with Renew. And this has been happening to me a lot lately. I don't know if I've had an opportunity to talk to you, um, but in recent days, I look at the scripture, I look at anything. I look at an advertisement on TV, I look at the scripture, and you know what it screams out to me? Gospel restored. Gospel restored. Gospel restored. Everything I look at, every thought that crosses my mind, I don't know what it is, but I like it. And so I just want to share this with you. The word renew, to give fresh life or strength is a definition. This is the one I like the most, though. To resume after an interruption. And our brother talked about the apostasy. And there was an interruption to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was part of that new and improved, right? It was all part of that process. To resume after an interruption. And when I looked at this logo and I saw the word renew, it screamed in my brain, it's the gospel restored. It's the precious pearl that we have. It's the truth in its fullness. And I don't think we should be shocked at all that there's going to be opposition to it. It's the purpose of the evil one. Let me give you my testimony. Real quick. I was the guy who was in his 20s, late 20s, sitting in church. I had a wife, I had a job, I, I didn't have any need. I had a house, I had money. And you know what the sermon was the Sunday that touched my heart? If you're comfortable, you're exactly where Satan wants you. If you think everything is good, it's marketing. You're completely fooled. And the Spirit of God fell upon me in that meeting, and I said, that's me. I'm that guy. I'm the one that's sitting here, enjoying blessing after blessing after blessing, and I'm not doing anything. I'm not giving back nearly enough. And so, if you're that way, there's room for you in the Church of Jesus Christ. I'll even go farther than that. There's a need for you in the Church of Jesus Christ. It's time for all hands on deck. We're fighting a battle that is being heavily marketed. We're fighting powers and principalities that we have no concept of. But guess what? We don't need it. Because our CEO is true, is honest, has only the best intention, and has salvation for all mankind. And I know it's impossible. I know it's, if we look at it in our natural minds, it's not possible. But our brother Paul said it, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And it's not gonna be because of marketing. I think it's gonna be more of the fiery side of that magnifying glass that helps us. But I do wanna give you this. I love the fact, so what is Satan doing? How is he trying to confound us, right? By making us confused, by hiding the, tr the simple truth, right? The plain and the precious things are hidden from this world. And it's, it's causing chaos. It's, it's hurting the souls of men and women. And we have an obligation. It's our, it's our service, it's our expected service to share the truth of what we know and understand. 
But one of the things I think is really interesting, and the world refers to it as backwards or upside down when they talk about the kingdom of God. It's enough to create confusion, right? And it works in both ways. I just wrote a couple of notes here. I'm not going to go over every scripture in the interest of time. But some of our brothers have already said it, right? That's enough to confuse the world, that these are the teachings of Christ, that if you want to receive, give. And you might say, what? Like, how does that work? But it's in the scripture. Give it away. And you'll get more in return. And this is one of my favorites. Weakness is power. I think Brother Paul, you said those words exactly. Right? When we might look at the things of God and we say, all you gotta do, all you have to do is have a repent spirit and believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. And the craziness of the world says, I'm not gonna quit, I'm not gonna give in. But the scripture is clear. If you succumb to Jesus Christ, you get everything. I like this one too. You want to be a leader? You want to be a ruler? Be a servant. Be a servant of everyone else. And that will exalt you. And I know what you're saying. You're saying the same thing that everyone in the world says. How is that possible? Right? If I humble myself, if I lower myself, how is that going to make a difference? Try it. Try it and see if the people of this world don't take note. Let it be an action item for you to have the spirit of servitude. And I'll tell you this, it's a win-win. Because if you do it this week, you're helping the brothers and sisters around you and their families. But you do it next week, and you're helping the world. And so let that be in the forefront of our mind. And then this is the most incredible thing, right? This is what the world debates and, and has been trying to be hidden. The truth has tried to be, uh, we see it in the scripture, right? And that is this, that you overcome, um, that you gain life through death. And if we review the scripture, they were on it right away. Right? Post guards, don't let anything happen, right? We we want to keep the we want to keep the lid on this. But it couldn't be contained, right? There's more than a stone that was rolled away that day. It was the truth was revealed. Undeniable truth. No matter how it's tried to, no matter how the world tries to obscure it or shade it. And I'm sure that it wasn't easily understood, right? That there were, there were those that followed Jesus that were present that said, I just don't get it. You're telling us you're gonna overcome death and then you die. How is it possible? But how beautiful is it to simply accept the plain and the precious truth that Jesus Christ can overcome death by death. And we have the same privilege, right? Dying daily, it was spoken about last night. Serving God with true intent and purpose and seeing the impact that it has on the world, even if it means our own demise. We'll be blessed, or we'll be blessed. How beautiful is that? How wonderful a promise from the, from the living God. And so I rejoice in that this, this day. Just the opportunity to share these thoughts, that there is a restored gospel, and it should be alive in everything we do, in all of our thoughts, 
to understand the magnitude of what we have access to and share that message with the world until the day that every knee bows and every tongue confesses. May God strengthen us. May the spirit of the living God be alive within your heart. And if it's alive within each and every one of your hearts, it's going to be burning like a fire here at this camp out. And it's going to continue to do the same as you disperse. May the Lord be with us. Up Saturday night. And, uh, it's been a few years since we've been in camp out. And uh, the Lord has been working. And we thank you for this message today. He is so good. He is so good. You want an hour? I'll tell you my testimony and what God has done for me. Young people know that God can do anything. Older people, senior people, know that God can do anything. Anything. And I'll tell you my testimony. Right now, let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for today. I thank you for this camp, oh Lord. I thank you for these brothers, these sisters, Lord, that are diligently doing your work, seeking you. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have set aside to worship you as we heard today in honor and in truth. Lord, I thank you for your blessings. Lord, I thank you for being here with us. As many can probably attest, they can feel your spirit, Lord, and I am thankful for that. Lord, be with us this week. Be with those that are still traveling. Lord, be with those that will be traveling home early. Allow them to continue to feel your spirit. Those that are at home watching, Lord, that you would be with them as well. Allow them to know that you are in control and that you can do anything. We thank you, Lord. We praise you this day. Lead, guide, and direct us always, Lord. But this week specifically, that our focus would be renewed, that our focus would be on you, that we would never lose that, Lord. And we would stay diligent to you as you were diligent to us. Lead, guide, and direct us always, Lord. Be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray.